This isn't actually, strictly speaking, a debate. There is no motion, and um, neither of the two speakers apparently <laughs> want to debate it, which is interesting, because I would have thought it would be a very easy no-brainer, but anyway. Um, uh, what we'll do is that uh, we'll give each of them uh, a five to ten minute start, is that okay? Um, and then I'll open it up uh, to a number of questions, comments from the audience, then we'll come back and take a few more minutes each perhaps to respond, uh, and then we'll go back and forth. Um, but um, yes, feel free to, uh, to think about things to come in on, uh, and uh, we'll try and make this as interactive as possible. And I'll try to say as little as possible. Um, so who wants to go first? Do you want to go first? go first? Okay. I think the challenge was more of trying to get someone to disagree uh, with the proposition, um, as opposed to wanting to debate. I think it's a very interesting proposition, actually. Um, I'm going to just spend five, ten minutes giving my thoughts on this. I'm going to kind of give two brief lines to this. One is conceptual and one is observational. Uh, and the reason why I want to tackle this conceptually is I've got a real problem with kind of debate motions and questions. It's something that the media does very well, where you can propose questions and propositional questions have a tendency to be um, emotive, loaded with assumptions, and very binary in nature, where you have to kind of assume that you're going to take a position of either yes or no. Is sectarianism a drive in the Middle East? Yes or no. And these matters are fundamentally not categorical. And I think it's really important to recognize that. It may seem like a very subtle point, but I think it's very important to recognize that. So conceptually, let's just deconstruct the proposition. And the reason why I want to do that is, one, to not assume any understanding. I don't know if we all share the same understanding of what politics is and what sec sectarianism is and so on. Um, secondly, to make sure that the proposition, if it is loaded by, with any assumptions, we deconstruct what those assumptions are. Uh, and therefore remove the emotive tendency to get led into those uh, uh, loaded assumptions that could be put forward in a proposition. Uh, secondary, to remove away the binary nature, and I think I put, made my position clear on that. I don't think this is a, a question of yes or no. Um, and lastly, to kind of ascertain that this matter is not one that is categorical. So in terms of deconstructing the proposition, I just did a quick di di uh, dictionary definition search before I came to make sure that the terms were easily understandable. In terms of sectarianism, the, the kind of meaning that I derived, it was interesting actually because a lot of it was, a lot of the definitions seemed to surround the idea that having any form of dogma makes you sectarian. Meaning that once you hold a position, you are by default holding a position and rejecting others. But I think the general sense of what we mean by sectarianism is one of the other definitions I found, which is when you take a position that's categorized by a bigot bigoted adherence to a factional viewpoint. So once you take a divisive view that eliminates any value in other people's uh, positions or ideas. So I think we can use that as a common meaning, and I'm happy to be challenged on that. Uh, in terms of what main means or primary means, I think we can understand that that means being the dominant cause. So sectarian being the main be, means, means it's the dominant cause. To drive is to push or to cause an effect. And politics is an interesting one. Politics in terms of what it means, ultimately politics is a men mental concept. It's a mental construct. It's not something that we find in the fabric of reality. Uh, you don't dig under the earth and find politics. Politics is a social affair. Um, and I think politics can be seen in two elements. The first element is the fact that politics is fundamentally um, social behaviors and activities to do with governance, how you um, manage human relations in a society. If I was the only guy living on this planet, there'd be no such thing as politics. It'd be me and the earth and whatever I kind of see fit to do with it. Um, once you introduce somebody else into that world, uh, you now need some sort of system that agrees uh, what do I do that doesn't affect this person and what can that person do that affects me and so on. The other one, which is, I think is also very interesting and quite important, is politics in the sense that it sets the perceived social attitudes and positions uh, through the fact that politics and governance is an influencing body. It's a socially influencing body. It's a position of influence. So influences the attitudes of society. 
Um, and also, you can get leadership positions that can influence society. So it can be influenced through positions of influence or through people of influence. Um, so what we learn from that is the fact that this proposition can't be categorical. Um, and when you unravel the meanings of the proposition, there is more to the meanings than, than meets the eye, especially when trying to understand the nature of politics and how sectarianism can relate to that. I'll just briefly spend a few minutes on what should be really the more important element, but we'll hopefully unravel this more in the discussion, uh, is on the observational side. On the observational side, I'm of the persuasion that this proposition is true only to a matter of degree. Um, and all, in my view, it is primarily a product of insecurity. So sectarianism, in the way that I defined it, I think is primarily a product of insecurity. And in order to understand the nature of sectarianism, particularly in the Middle East, and the kind of instability that that gives rise to, uh, we need to understand the sources of insecurity. What gives rise to the insecurity which gives rise to sectarianism? I'll just throw a few ideas out there and we can, we can discuss them further. Uh, one being economic conditions, obviously. Uh, another one is justice or a some sort of judicial function that society has confidence in, which removes insecurity. Uh, another is whether it's a society that has been gripped by violence. Obviously, violence is a fundamental element of insecurity. I think on a very soft side and a very important side, the feeling of hope and opportunity gives rise to insecurity, or the lack of feeling of hope and opportunity. And it may also be, and this is probably a sensitive subject, culture. There could be an element of cultural insecurity. Uh, and lastly, uh, a thought is also that there could be historic insecurity, natures of insecurity that are embedded in society because of a history that's going to take generations potentially to change the social psyche as a consequence of that history. And obviously politics. Uh, and as I define politics, it would encompass all the ones that we discussed before, being the function of governance in society uh, or that body which can influence social attitudes. So insecurity could be actually fundamentally a product of politics, which reverses the motion all the way uh, round. Um, so just to wrap up, really, that kind of, in a very short uh, uh, way, emphasize, emphasizes the importance that advocating political and economic stability uh, and the forces which can lead to political and economic stability is a very important factor in reducing sectarianism and its influence on politics. Uh, and in that, in that sense, we need to choose how we are influenced because a huge part of what I discussed earlier in terms of politics is how leadership and leadership positions can influence social attitudes. And therefore, we have a choice to make about how we choose to be influenced. Uh, in the discussions, I'll, uh, to not take anyone else's time, I'll discuss more about examples of how insecurity reads, leads to divisions in society. Um, and I'll draw on some of these examples and what we can learn from them. That's it. Uh, thank you, Hafiz. Um, hey there. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm actually quite glad Tawfiq went first and uh, talked through some of the conceptual uh, elements and the definitions of the keywords we're, we're talking about today. Um, because uh, I'm purely going to be talking about observational and, and the examples we can see in the Middle East. Um, uh, throughout history and, and, and today as well. Um, I'll be frank from the outset, this is a very confusing topic for me. Um, the region is very confusing. I can't remember who said this, um, but to paraphrase, uh, he said, if you think you know, uh, if, you, if you think you understand the Middle East, uh, then think again. And sort of thinking and rethinking these topics is always a, uh, an interesting um, thing to do, which is why I agreed to come here today. Um, I think sectarianism, we need to be honest with ourselves, it is a major uh, problem in the, in the Middle East. But the question we're discussing today is, is it a driver? Uh, is it the main driver, sorry, of Middle Eastern politics? Um, so over the last 10 years, everyone's seen a, a huge increase in sectarian rhetoric, sectarian violence, sectarian conflict, um, kind of sparked by the uh, invasion of Iraq, more recently in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, and of course, uh, with what's happening today in Syria. And here I'm not just talking about political sectarianism. If anyone's been uh, uh, paying attention to the satellite channels, to the forums, to the internet, there's been a, a, a huge escalation in sectarian rhetoric 
Um, so it's even on a social and cultural level. I mean, even uh, drama and, and TV and soap operas uh, in the Middle East, sectarianism sort of comes through. Um, a, a scholar, an Iraqi scholar, who's a scholar on Iraq, Fanar Haddad, he recently gave an interview with the BBC uh, on sectarianism. Although he's talking specifically about the Iraqi example, I think it, it, um, what he says um, makes sense when we look at the region as a whole. He says generally there's, specifically with this uh, question we're discussing, he says generally there's two groups of people. Uh, on the one hand, we have those who constantly uh, exaggerate uh, sectarianism and the other group who's allergic to it. So they hate talking about sectarianism. And I think the, the, the answer to this question should be more nuanced. Like Tawfiq said, it's not a, a yes or no. Um, so going through history, and I'm always wary about talking about history with a, with a historian sat next to me. But I think it's, in, it's important, specifically when we talk about uh, the Middle East. I mean, essentially, the term the Middle East was, was a term the British used, the British colonial uh, powers, to describe this region where there's even different definitions of what the Middle East actually is and which countries are part of the Middle East and, and, and which aren't. And so before World War II, the entire Middle East was, was a battleground between uh, the British and French imperial powers. And here, sectarianism did play sort of uh, a role, specifically if you're looking at Iraq in the 1920s. Sectarianism was an aspect of the politics of the Middle East, but it was sort of underneath the major driver, which was um, uh, imperial powers fighting over influence uh, uh, in that region, which I think today um, we can clearly see. Uh, through the Cold War years, again, we had two huge superpowers, the USA and the USSR, uh, fighting an economic slash ideological uh, war. And in the context of the Middle East, this played out between the, the revolutionary regimes uh, and the conservative monarchy. So the obvious examples would be Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia. But of course, Iraq and Iran um, were at times on, on, on both sides. Um, why I say it's not the main driver of, of Middle Eastern politics is because there are um, very important uh, other drivers, which, which I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but certainly I don't think in this context sectarianism is, is the main one. We have uh, ideological debate uh, throughout the region. Um, if you pick out key uh, countries, Iran, Egypt, uh, Libya even, um, there's, there's a debate over, um, on the one hand, you have the more secular left-wing liberal uh, groups, and on the other hand, you have the Islamists. And of course, Islamist groups on both, on both Shia and Sunni Islamic Islamist groups can be sectarian, but the debate itself has nothing to do with sectarianism. Um, on both sides, there are Islamist parties and there are uh, secular parties. Um, another uh, important aspect of Middle East party, of course, is energy security. Over 50% uh, of the world's oil reserves lie in this region, and it's important for you know, the big powers and the oil companies to extract uh, this oil. And this, of course, affects the, the, the politics, the economic interests of both the, the major uh, international oil companies and, and global powers. Again, we have, you know, although it's nothing like the Cold War, there is uh, an American-Russian uh, struggle over hegemony in the region, and that plays out, you know, even if we take Syria as example today, and of course China has economic interests in the region. So even when we see sectarianism in these individual states, it, there's, there's a much larger uh, picture I think we need to look out, uh, to look for, sorry. Um, of course, there's also a Saudi-Iranian Cold War, quote unquote, you know, some scholars call it a Cold War, some scholars call it a Middle Eastern uh, Cold War, and some even an Islamic Cold War, uh, Charles Tripp, for example. And the fact that Saudi is, is, is a Sunni state and Iran is a Shia state, uh, of course, affects the, the sectarian dynamics in the region, but it would be simplistic to say um, either country relies on that um, as, as a tool to, you know, to, to project their power. Um, the last one I had here is, is, is the Arab Spring. I mean, this, this one, again, you can use it on both sides of the argument because of what's happening in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Syria, uh, Iraq, even to a lesser extent. Um, sectarianism is a big problem. It's, it's something we can all see if any of us are, are, you know, are paying attention to, to, to the news. And, and the media here plays an important role, which I'll come to uh, in a second. 
But the point is the Arab Spring, it's a, a political socio-economic uh, struggle where people are um, calling for dignity, they're calling for social quality, they're calling for political rights, they're calling for democracy. They're not calling for Shia rule, they're not calling for Sunni rule. Maybe some you know, small mi uh, minority groups are, but if you take the, the, the Middle East as, as a region, the, the, main, you know, the main lesson we've been learning uh, over the last 18 months or, or, or two years now is, is people want dignity, people want, uh, want a voice for themselves. And I think the uprising you know, show that very clearly, that while sectarianism, again, can play a role, it's not the main driver. I just want to briefly talk about media emphasis because you know, I don't think anyone here lives in the Middle East, so most of what we, what we know of the Middle East uh, is, is through the media. And I'd like to take two examples the, on complete opposite ends of the you know, left-right political spectrum. But we have D Daniel Pipes, um, who looks at uh, the media and Israel. And um, there's a quote I'd like to read uh, in full because it, it helps us understand as well when we're looking at sectarianism. He says, the media do not just report Middle East news, they also create it. Much of what the media finds significant must be discounted. The historian must carefully ignore their emphases and interpretations, which so often turn out to be misguided uh, or worse. And of course, Edward Said, who's, who's uh, most famous for uh, writing Orientalism, in a later book called Covering Islam, um, makes a very similar point. He says, if you look at the way Islam is portrayed in the media, um, it's a very negative portrayal and it affects, uh, it skews our perception. And the book is actually called Covering Islam. And covering is both the media sense of covering uh, Islam, but also he used it cleverly to, to suggest a covering, the obscuring uh, the reality. And of course, the media is, is, is constantly talking about sectarianism in the region. And I think we need to um, question um, why this is the case. Because uh, there's a vicious circle here that the media uh, affects our perceptions. Um, then we have academics and uh, uh, policy analysts who relay sort of that information to the policy makers. And then the policy makers, and I'm talking about the Western policy makers, um, enact policies in that region which then might uh, compound and aggravate the sectarian conflict. So it becomes a vicious cycle. What you think a country is a certain way, your policies reflect your thinking, and it might become a, a self fulfilling prophecy. Uh, lastly, I just want to quickly talk about sectarianism as a, as a political tool. So, of course, the key two examples are, are, are Jordan's King Abdullah, who talked about the Shia Crescent, uh, Iran and, and Levant, uh, and going... Um, so, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And he's sort of uh, scaremongering about this, you know, there's a sectarian uh, threat here, and it destabilizes us. And, of course, these are key buzzwords that... Uh, get the attention of, of, of powers like, like the USA. And of course, uh, Mubarak, uh, alhamdulillah, no longer in power now, but he also uh, was one of, the, I think, the, the first Arab leader to publicly question the loyalty of Arab Shia. And he says, the Arab are Shia, the Shia are loyal to Iran, they're not loyal to their countries. And it's important to realize how effective this is as a political tool because it works on a, on a local level. Um, when you have internal dissent, by externalizing it, by saying, you know, these particular group of people are loyal to, to, to a power that's outside the country, you shore up your own uh, support base. It's important on a, on a regional sort of level because, you know, you have, you have uh, neighbors who are your allies uh, who will stand by you. And of course, on an international level, if, if, if every domestic problem, you point the finger and you say Shia or Iran, then somebody like, like America will, will, will uh, not try to cross you. Um, I think that's, that's about right. Uh, yes, um, last point, just quickly I jotted it down, is um, one of the main drivers of, of, of sectarian, oh sorry, getting confused now. One of the main drivers of Middle Eastern politics is US interests in the Middle East. And specifically, I'm talking about the survival of Israel, access to oil, which I already talked about, and blocking a, a, a hostile regional hegemon, whether that be an internal one or, or external, whether it be Russia, Iran, or China. And I think this plays a very uh, uh, big and important role in, in the politics of the Middle East. Actually, no, I have one more last point. Uh, Daniel Pipes, again, he, he, in 2009, he came out with a, 
uh, an article in the Jerusalem Post where he says you can look at uh, Middle Eastern politics by not Shia, Sunni, US, Russia, but by looking at two blocks in the region. One he called the, the uh, resistance axes and the other the status quo block. So the status quo block would be at that time Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, uh, the GCC countries, uh, Jordan, the, the, most of the monarchies, and the axes of resistance included uh, Iran, Syria, uh, Iran, Syria, Libya, and uh, Hamas, and Hezbollah specifically in, in Lebanon. And actual, the actual word, I, I, according to Wikipedia, and I'm sorry to cite Wikipedia, but the, the actual uh, um, axes of resistance was first used by the Libyans uh, in 2002, I think it was, uh, as a response to Bush's axes of evil. But the interesting thing is, is this quote, the axis of resistance, has been used by the Libyans, it's been used by the Iranians, it's been used by the Palestinians, it's been used by the uh, Syrians. So again, you have both Shia and Sunnis who see um, the region as essentially people who dislike uh, America and those who, you know, uh, do. And um, I, I think that's about it, and I hope we can flesh out some of these uh, ideas in discussion. And apologies if I took longer than I should have. Okay, th thank you. Uh, um, just want to clarify, uh, just to take one of the points, there are two issues. One is, uh, I don't think uh, this issue of uh, highlighting sectarianism comes from the media. I think it comes from the policymakers, the politicians, who then is used by the media to uh, highlighted because um, um, uh, you know many times uh, the media and the and, and the government the politicians work in tandem in especially on international issues so uh, rather than uh, because uh, we've seen this uh, used by uh, uh, Tony Blair when he, uh, he was discussing about Iran and the and, and the other states in the region um, and the secondly, uh, the issue of um, that uh, secularism doesn't play a major role. I think it does in a sense. Um, it is being used to um, uh, drive their political agendas. So you find that, so when there was a war between Iraq and uh, Iran, sectarianism was used by both Iran and Saudi Arabia and others to highlight you know, that we are fighting against uh, Shias and so on, so, and by Saddam. And similarly, we have the same situation in Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan, uh, which has predated the, uh, the current um, uh, uh, the war between, uh, 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 sorry, the war in Iraq, in a sense, when the, uh, um, the Shiism and Sunnism, there wasn't there before, say, Zia al-Haq, for instance, as much. But later on, when the, his influence, and therefore Saudi influence came into the existence, we had this, uh, killing in mosques and so on. It was very sectarianism. So we've had this in, uh, in Pakistan. It was used by, again, by Iran later on and, and, and uh, Saudi Arabia and so on. And now in the Gulf, it is heavily being used against Shias uh, as being, if you're a Shia, you have a huge problem, you can't get jobs. And you know, um, uh, the policymakers are using it every time. If you look at Qatar, would, uh, uh, the Gulf states, as, uh, they would mention that Syria, which is uh, Shia controlled in Sunni majority. Uh, similarly, the Iran is supporting because they are Shias. And you have even the, um, those who are involved in the uprisings in the Arab world uh, have been using this as well. So I think it, makes a, uh, it does play a huge role, but you know, it's just being used uh, for political gains, yes. But it, it is a, uh, one of the main drivers. Um, thank you. Um, I think you're both right in that um, there are kind of underlying factors um, which definitely play a part in um, kind of driving Middle Eastern politics. Um, what I wanted to ask is why, um, in a lot of senses, does it manifest itself um, in kind of sectarian rhetoric or sectarian kind of um, identity? Why is that the kind of why is why why do people identify in that way um, as opposed to any other way? 
that well, makes sense. I think it's a product of the human condition. I, I see this in corporations. Um, if I told you United States politics, what would you think? You'd think very partisan, Republican, Democrat, point scoring. Um, so the, the, con the idea that you look for divisions in society because it's, it's, a, it's a tool that helps to either externalize a problem um, or it's a way of deflecting or it's a matter of ignorance appears to be a product of the human condition. Why this particular division though? When, when it manifests as sectarianism in areas, if we define sectarianism the way I defined it, um, it, and even then the definition doesn't necessarily relate to religion, it relates to dogma, so you can't expand it, but in the common sense we look at sectarianism being religious, you, know, you have political division, it's not really viewed as sectarian. In areas of the world where that identity seems to have more value, so in the US, there is more value, P the society is more va sees more value in affiliating itself with a political party. In the Middle East, there seems to be m more of a value in that kind of affiliation, in that kind of um, social, there's more social value to it. But you could look at other societies, if you think of Rwanda, the kind of associations people have there is not Sunni or Shia. It's more to do with, the, with the, it's more to do with the, with a clan or a tribe. I don't, I don't profess to understand Rwanda very well. Um, but when you think of Rwanda, you know that there is a, a perceived division there amongst two peoples, if I can use that term. Uh, you say Nigeria. There's a religious division in Nigeria which causes uh, elements of instability. So it, it manifests itself in different ways depending on the kind of value that's given to elements of identity in a society. Um, but I think it's more... S so that's on one level. But then it only grows into a problem when I think you have insecurity. If you had a secure society where people didn't feel like their identity was under threat, it wouldn't manifest itself as an issue. And at the same time, having sectarian is kind of a negatively loaded word, but having sectarianism, or, or if you were to abs abstract away from it, division of, of ideas from a religious point of view isn't necessarily problematic unless it becomes emotive and violent. And the problem with the Middle East is it's emotive and violent. Um, US politics, is borderline insane, um, potentially big in the emotive realm, doesn't get violent. Uh, so the problem in the region, of Middle East in particular, is, is the violence element. The fact that people see the value so extreme in that identity and feel so insecure about that identity being undermined that it's justifiable to kill. And that's, that's the insane element, I think. Let me just uh, say one thing about that. Um, I think I think perhaps the problem is this word sectarianism. Um, a while ago, admittedly something I never published, but I, I suggested we should just use the word communalism. Um, communalism, uh, extensively used in the study of South Asia, been around for at least a couple of generations, and it's a way in which you deal with different types of identity, whether they're religious, tribal, um, caste, um, ethnic and so forth and fundamentally basically means it's about preferring your community over others often as a defensive mechanism but it's this uh, this idea of preferring your community over others and usually to the detriment of others and you know and, and it's a political phenomenon I mean sectarianism one of the problems with the question is sectarianism is politics so it affects politics well it affects itself sectarianism by definition is is a form of politics already. Um, I want to come back to what Ahmed said, and hi then, perhaps you have a comment on that before we open it out again. Did you have something to say when, about Ahmed's point? I mean, I, I did mention it's, it's a cycle. So the media plays a role, the policy makers play a role, then it actually affects the reality on the ground, and then that feeds into you know, the, the, the media cycle again. But no, I completely agree with you. I think sectarianism is, is, is a big problem, but I would hesitate to say it's the, it's the main driver. It, it, it's a vehicle, it's a tool that's used, but is, is it actually the main driver? I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't argue that it is. You know, on the, on the media front, there's a tendency to kind of look at the, um, the media and political narrative when it comes to this stuff in a somewhat conspiratorial tone. And I'm not saying that's intended, mm. but there is a tendency in my, in my opinion. My own observation of kind of the human condition is um, we're not immune to that. Like I said, if I said Rwanda, what do you guys know about Rwanda? 
other than the fact that there is a division amongst two people. Um, it's probably a lot more complicated than that on the ground. Uh, if I said Northern Ireland, what would you think about Northern Ireland? So therefore, to, to Johnny English, when you say Middle East, <laughs> what's he supposed to think? It's not a part that features very much in his life, other than something that kind of they come across in the press every so often. So it's a product of ignorance, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, on the point of the media, I, I don't think it is sinister. I don't think, you know, some, some, you can tell some of the agencies and some of the, the news outlets, they obviously do have an agenda. But generally, I, I speak very boldly when I talk about the media. I don't think it's, you know, I, I certainly don't have a conspiratorial viewpoint on this, and I don't think it's sinister, but it's, it's sort of a product of design. I mean, the media, it wants to give information to the public fast. The information has to be simple and, you know, the yeah. sad fact is, it's, it's very easy for me to say the problem in country A is between Shia and Sunni, because this is easy for the public to di digest. Sorry, I just want, uh, I, I didn't mean conspiratorial issue, but and I was see, referring to media you guys. gets briefed, because I, I work in that yeah. uh, field, in the political field, right? So we get briefed by the government uh, uh, policy makers, and the, and the media, you know, uh, when, for example, anything that happens in any region, there, there's a briefing. And the media uses that briefing yeah, to reflect uh, the briefing. Yeah. Press so in a way, yeah. it is working in tandem rather than, yeah. you know, uh, agenda kind of thing. And and that's because most journalists are lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other questions, comments? I think with regards to the media, I agree that you know it's it's very there's a set agenda and you know it depends. They're not they tend to generalize and whitewash. But um, with regards to Daniel Pipes, I think that's a completely different category. Um, there's actually a really interesting report written by the Center for American Progress. Um, it's called Fear Inc. Um, it talks about I'm sure you guys have come across it, but it talks about you know the likes of Daniel Pipes and Pam Geller being funded by a very small group of people. And it's just a very small incestuous system that sustains the, these messages. So I think, I think that is a different category <laughs> altogether. Um, yeah. No, I, I knew somebody would, would pick up on the Daniel Pipes quote, but I'm, 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 what I quoted had nothing to do with his political ideological bent. It's simply a quote which describes how the media affects our perceptions. And immediately after, I did quote Edward Said, which says, you know, a very similar thing, but on a different topic. I agree. I mean, you know, it did have a set agenda, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is Daniel Pipes, Pam Geller have a very direct agenda um, to basically white, you know, whitewash and label Islam as, you know, ter a, ter you know a terrorist religion. Um, well, Orientalism you know, was different in the sense that it was fear of the unknown, maybe. So there, I think there were different factors involved with that. No, I mean, so. sorry to bog down on this point. We're talking about completely different topics, but the phenomenon is the same. Daniel Pipes is saying uh, the, the obsession with Israel affects the public's perception of how important Israel is in the region. Edward Said saying the media's negative portrayal of Islam affects the public's perception of Islam. So forget what that, you know, uh, the specific agendas of, of both people. It's, it's the phenomenon, is, it's, it's, it's the same. We're, talk, we're essentially talking about the same thing. We're talking about how the media affects our perception of A, B, C, X. I'm not defending Daniel Pipes, by the way. Uh, it's, it's very simple. I mean, Pipes' point is, this is the way it works, and this is what we should do. Whereas Said is more of a caveat, saying this is what happens, so watch out for it. I mean, it's... You know, if, if you're going to manipulate things, then you need to basically get the message out how you do it. Um, moving on from the media, um, I, I don't think they play that much of a role. But um, what I do think, I th what I think plays a bigger role is actually our religious narrative, um, the way we use rhetoric, the way we, um, I think, see ourselves as opposed to the other sects the way that it's constantly, constantly being built up. And it obviously, if you have a narrative that sets you against another sect, in a way, it's all, that's why sectarianism happens, because it, 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 it does flare up during insecurity. But what is it that drives it? During those periods, there's a constant, constant sort of, I, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, it's not a brush struck, I'm not saying everyone does it, but both sides do engage in this sort of almost delegitimization 
of the other, and I think that plays a role, definitely. Okay, this is one for Sajjad to comment on. I agree with that. I think that that's true. And I think it extends beyond dogma in the religious sense. It extends to political uh, partisanship as well. It just manifests itself as being more emotive in the religious sense, where in, in communities where religion is taken very seriously and, as a, and becomes a very serious matter as a consequence. I mean, it really just comes down to how we use language. And um, we will use different people use different types of symbols. My, my problem is when people start saying you shouldn't use any sort of religious language or religious symbols, and by definition, if you use that, it's sectarian. I have a problem with that, um, because that's what some elements of the secular left, there are a few still alive in the Middle East, um, even in the Gulf, actually, um, would say, no, no, you can't use any sort of religious language. But I'll, I'll give you an example of, of how sometimes things kind of backfire. About a year ago, um, a bit more than a year ago, I was in Kuwait, and uh, someone I know had, um, who's sort of a Shia intellectual, uh, has a reputation for being broadly non-sectarian, um, wrote an, an open letter to some of the um, Ikhwani members of parliament, whose response to Bahrain had been extremely sectarian, sort of saying this is a Shia conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so he wrote this long letter to them, uh, complaining about their sectarian attitude. Unfortunately, he used a very problematic metaphor. He said, basically, politics, it comes down to this. You're either with Ali or you're with Mawia. <laughs> own goal, serious own goal. And so just because he put that little paragraph in, the, le the whole letter is just discredited. Um, so one has to be quite careful about the use of language. Of course, he's right. <laughs> 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 Is there a reason that the Middle East have more insecurities than, and, and they, they respond by violence than, than any I wouldn't say it's just the Middle East. The world is riddled with violence. The Middle East kind of stands out in people's minds who are interested in the Middle East. I speak to my Nigerian friends and they speak about Nigeria most of their life. Um, insecurity in the Middle East is a complex dynamic of regional and international interests, but there is insecurity in, in the world as a whole. And you could almost, again, abstract this, and I'm sorry to kind of be, be too conceptual, to being part of the human condition. We have insecurities. So we as individuals have insecurities and you can socialize those insecurities. And in fact, when they get socialized, they become even more dangerous because there's something about the way groups behave that just breeds irrationality upon irrationality. Um, so you could say fundamentally it's just a product of, of, of things that are within us, um, but it's compounded and coupled by um, social conditions. So in social environments where you have um, no real sense of opportunity and hope, a lack of economic development, no real sense of justice, so there's a judicial system that people can rely on. Uh, and you compare societies where there is more elements of that. I don't think that we can compare to a, a perfect society in the world, but there are more elements of a fair judicial system, more elements where people feel like they have opportunity and hope, um, seem to be more stable and more secure. And therefore, those societies where people have insecurities, where they have elements of um, value or I ideology, especially if there is a narrative which already breeds a sense of division, uh, it's very easy to then cook that emotion and make it into something much bigger. And what that's... I don't think that's, I don't think that's a fair... Well, I, I do... I, that, that's, a, that's an interesting, it's an interesting thought, and I did say there is a cultural element, but I, I can't go to the point of generalizing without having a lot to qualify to say the Middle East is culturally more insecure. I mean, that, I can't do that. I don't even know <laughs> if that's true. Um, but there is perhaps an element of that where the social conditions have bred to a sense of frustration where there is more reaction, potentially. But I wouldn't say that's isolated to the Middle East. Middle Eastern issues um, are kind of higher on the agenda and as a consequence are more emotive. But I agree with you, when we look at the cartoon issue, 
and the whole region flares up. Um, yet there's kind of poverty issues and there's violence issues, but the, the, the same emotions never really provoke. Uh, two quick things before. Uh, one is, uh, if you want to see violence, you should, you should hang out in certain parts of this country on a Friday night or Saturday night, um, and you will see violence at the drop of a pen um, of the most ridiculous type. O on, the, on some of these demonstrations, I think um, it's hugely exaggerated. I mean, take the example of Pakistan a few weeks ago where on the Friday the government called a, uh, a holiday which was like, yeah, go out and riot. But it wasn't everyone rioting. It was very particular sectors. And it was young angry men associated with certain political parties. Um, so it wasn't, and, and a lot of this Muslim rage stuff is, is hugely manufactured. Um, you know, someone did a, a survey on percentages of people actually involved in demonstrations which turned ugly, and they're, they're tiny compared to, for example, the people who were in, um, you know, sort of Lulu Roundabout or Tahrir or whatever. I mean, tiny, tiny fractions, but, you know, it, it depends on how you frame a, um, a, a video camera. Let's go to... Um, to any one of, any of you, how far do you consider uh, the lack of a, a mature democracy with grassroots buy-in to the democratic process um, to be the main driver of the actual sectarianism and the politics there? Well, I think the lack of that is a big contributory factor to the lack of stability and insecurity, which therefore breeds the, the other elements. So I, I, I think that is a major factor. Because it removes the sense of hope, the sense of participation, the sense that you have a view. I could draw my own experiences. I, I mean, half my family is from Syria, um, and I've traveled there extensively. Um, and, and you see it in the society, in a society where people don't, compared to where I live in, in Britain, people don't feel like they are an active participant in the socio-political framework of the society. It's just not. And it's so, it becomes so ingrained in the psyche even though this could be a phenomenon that may have just lived several generations. It's not something that's endemic in the history of Syria. Um, but it's enough to be so ingrained in the cultural psyche, and it's really hard to overcome. You know, it's really hard. It takes generations to try and change that kind of um, psyche. And, and the lack of that means you don't feel like you have a participatory right. You don't feel like you're engaged. You don't feel like your views matter. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a big factor. I wouldn't say it's the only factor, because, again, Societies are complex, and, and, and it's, it's more complex than just that. But I'd say that is a big factor. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's, it's a, even a bigger factor than, than sectarianism. I mean, if, if the Arab Spring has taught us anything, it is that, you know, social, uh, economic, and political uh, grievances uh, can cause people, you know, to get violence. And the insecurity, as Tawfiq was talking about, then breeds the sectarianism. So again, here, sectarianism isn't the main driver. It was, it was you know, dignity. People want democracy. People want freedom. And, yeah, I, I don't know. People may disagree, but I think in, in the Arab Spring, even taking the example of Syria, which is, you know, clearly now the most violent case, it didn't start off as, as a sectarian issue with, you know, regional powers uh, aligning with the people um, depending on their sectarian affiliation. It was people peacefully protesting, wanting uh, more political rights. Uh, the government, you know, lashed out. They, they peacefully protested, the government hit them with sticks. They picked up sticks, the government you know, picked up guns. They picked up guns, the government picked up tanks, and, and it's where we are now. But the initial driver wasn't sectarianism. Any f further comments? I just realized we're missing yeah. the action on the tweets. Everyone's reading. Yeah, I don't think it. <laughs> I, I mean, w one thing about um, insecurity is it's absolutely rife. Um, there's, there's been some very interesting recent um, debates, particularly on the left, about how um, what we're seeing, for example, in Europe and North America, which is as severe as anything happening anywhere else, is a, break a breakdown of, of the social contract. Um, and the social contract is, it's kind of ironic that at the same time that people are kind of moving back towards that position in the Middle East, <laughs> it's just not working um, in places like the US, Spain, Greece, arguably Britain. Um, you know, I certainly didn't vote for this government. 
and actually most people didn't vote for this government. Um, so there were lots of issues about accountability even within so-called liberal democratic states, and liberal democratic states have um, a huge crisis on their hands, which is then exacerbated by the economic situation, and you've got the rise of the right, and you know it's um, rioting on the streets, as we've already seen, and we'll probably see much more of that to come. Um, so it's a certain irony that people want to, uh, you know, take up these liberal democratic values um, at the time when, um, frankly, they don't seem to be really working. And um, arguably, I would say they've never worked um, in the most successful democracies, so to speak, that we have had. Um, uh, it's it's an uh, and this is why the I would always link the Occupy movements with the Arab Spring. There was a, a great continuity uh, in what was happening across the board. Um, a lot of very similar um, rhetoric. A lot of the very similar types of mobilization. I don't know if, how many of you ever went to any of these Occupy sit-ins, um, but you looked at that. You looked at what was happening in some places like in Cairo, etc very similar phenomenon, very similar types of mobilization, very similar types of very localized power, the idea of doing things. But actually, to be perfectly honest, they were all clueless. All of them were clueless. Even in Egypt, nothing would have happened unless the army hadn't <laughs> decided to change. So when you actually spoke to a lot of these young guys, whether it was in you know, Buenos Aires or in Madrid or Cairo, etc., they were all clueless. They all, they all knew that they didn't want what was happening to continue, but they actually had no idea how to change it. Did you say liberal democratic models failed? I didn't quite understand that. Yeah. What, would you, what do you mean by liberal democratic models? Accountability. How, how you know, accountability? The question is, well, there's accountability, there's um, what you mean by liberalism. I mean, there's this, this, this whole problem that we have now between the two sides of liberalism. It's becoming a huge issue. Um, is, is, does liberal mean tolerant and inclusive and pluralistic? Or does liberal mean, yes, we've finally achieved a set of values which are universalizable, universal, and they have to be imposed universally? Um, and that conflict is, is becoming very skewed as well in most cases. But fundamentally, it's about, um, it's the very cynical stuff. We don't ultimately run government. Uh, the government is supposed to be representative of us. We're supposed to kind of um, uh, bring about the change by electing people. But to be perfectly honest, we don't make policy. We don't actually affect anything. Um, it's a very small minority of people who do. Um, but we are all given um, a right to play the game. Uh, and we kind of play the game. And in some countries, the game is played badly. So you have like massive vote rigging. In some countries, the play game is played a lot better. I, and I'm very cynical. I, I appreciate the sentiment. I was going to say that's a very cynical view. Um, and I appreciate the, I, I kind of appreciate the direction that you're coming from on it. But what I, the only thing I would say is I think there is a, there's an issue of expectation where we're almost seeking a model that we can um, run for a few decades and then measure uh, its success based on the number of social crises they, they tend to have. I agree there's a big accountability issue in the West. I agree that um, uh, economic interest has a huge influencing factor. But you know, one thing I have become a very pragmatist on is recognizing the fact that if I got arrested in Syria, my, my likelihood of going through the judicial system sane is just not comparable with going through the judicial system in Great Britain. And, and that's a function of a model that has elements of governance that the society has confidence in. So not saying that therefore the model is perfect, not saying that there aren't accountability issues, not saying that there is a political game. And yes, we're invited once every four years to choose which of the candidates we think has a nicer smile, um, and so on and so forth. But I, I, I just, my personal opinion is that I would, I would, while I appreciate the cynicism and I appreciate the, the, the kind of, the, the critique, um, which I think is largely valid, um, I would just recognize the fact that the models give us a lot that other people don't have. Well, I mean, one, one of the fundamental issues within liberalism ought, ought to be about choice. You know, the, the fundamental uh, 
Tourists. idea choice, not tourists. Well, what do tourists <laughs> got to do with it? Um, in, in the sense that the, the core of liberalism is the idea of the autonomous self, which is reasoning, which is capable of making decisions and, and so forth. Um, and of course, we know that there is no choice. Uh, there is no, for example, political party in this country who is willing openly to say that they think um, that the idea that you have to reduce the deficit before everything else is nonsense. No one's going to ever say that. So where's the choice? Um, in the States, it's even worse. You have someone like you know, Obama, who a lot of people had a lot of hope for. I have you know, family who worked in his administration and stuff. And they're hugely disappointed because what has he actually done since he's been in power? He's done absolutely nothing. Um, and so fundamentally, this issue of choice becomes uh, problematic. Now, of course, in Syria, you have no choice, right? In, in Iraq, um, you have a choice if you're with the right guys, right? In, in Lebanon, again, you probably have choice in a particular area if, you're, if it's your, your kind of hood. Um, so that's a big problem. Um, the, the, the one thing which I, just coming back to the topic, one, one thing which I want to actually <laughs> raise Bombshell, uh, at last. Um, was um, institutionalized. We haven't talked about institutionalized sectarianism. And the two most obvious cases, one Iraq. which is much more established is, is Lebanon. Um, you're probably familiar with Osama Maktisi's very interesting book, The Culture of Sectarianism and about how sectarianism is very much ingrained within the By the way, I had a brilliant quote institutes. from Osama Muqdisi, but okay. uh, lost. Well, lost yeah, we'll give it to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and in a sense, how arguably what's developing in Iraq is, well, in a good outcome, it would be like Lebanon. <laughs> but I'm not sure if it's necessarily going that. So, so the question is, if you, if you institutionalize sectarianism in this way, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, is it a good way of at least managing expectations, identities, violence, or not? I think, do we have time for last comments? Or just yeah. the, the idea of institutionalized sectarianism is, is, I think, a very important one. We both missed it. Um, but I, I went to Iraq last year uh, as part of a, a government-sponsored delegation with about 130 expatriates. And it was unbelievable the blatant, we are Shia, we are in power, and we're going to ram it down your throats, whether you're Shia or Sunni. Um, at the airport, everyone who was with me was Shia. When we got to uh, Iraq, the actual official ministerial buses, uh, it was the Ministry of Sp Youth and Sport, were playing Shia Anashid and Shia Latmiyas. And you're looking around the bus and, and you know that guy's Sunni, that guy's a Kurd, and yet you're, you're, you know, it's this in your face, um, we are here now. And, and that worries me because in, in five, ten years time, I, I don't know what Iraq would be. And even the, the actual agenda, we went to, obviously we went to meet Maliki, we, went, we, met, we met his uh, uh, aides, uh, we met Sisani's representative, they took us two nights to Karbala, uh, one day in Najaf, uh, one day they even took us in the middle of the desert because Imam Ali um, uh, passed through here uh, over a thousand years ago. And it, and it was interesting places to see, I'm not going to say it wasn't interesting, but as an Iraqi, not as a Shia, I was thinking this st doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right for the non-Iraqi Shia uh, who don't, won't necessarily enjoy a, a Shia Nasheed blaring uh, in the bus. But yeah. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I, I don't think institutional sectarianism, you know, when you design a society along those lines, it's really, it's really unfortunate because you've, you've created, I mean, in Lebanon, it's such a complex situation. My, the other half of my family is Lebanese, so I've got both sides of the issue. Um, it's uh, it's 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 like never ending, and and really the debate in Lebanon now amongst people who are just absolutely fed up is saying we need to just rewrite the constitution now to break up this sectarian issue of the Maronite gets X seats and the Sunni gets Y seats. Um, but it was formed again out of an environment of insecurity. It was formed out of an environment where you had those factions and they wanted to make sure that they actually had a stake and no other faction was going to completely eradicate their existence. You take away the insecurity effectively becomes a non-issue. I've never met someone in Britain who is so passionately from Devon that it's such an issue in their identity that it becomes everything that defines their character to the point that Devon needs one... Scotland? Well, interesting. The Cornish, the Cornish are pretty uppity. In, yeah, no, well, but you know what? That, that, isn't, that is a... a there, is a there is a... <laughs> 
Yeah. There, that is a derivative of that. I mean, you wouldn't call it sectarian as such. But again, it's an identity issue, and it goes back to you know. We're, again, we're debating the Scotland issue now. Um, I don't know what insecurities give rise to that. But in terms of Iraq, I think it's it's uh, interesting you mentioned that, Haider. Um, the one thing, my experience of view on this is a lot of these stuff come and go in cycles. I reckon if, if Iraq sees stability, it could be a matter of decades and things like this could dissolve because people's attentions just move on to something else. At the moment, it's such a big identity reaction because they had all this period of being unable to do it. And wow, we're in power. Wow, I can play this record and I can shout about this. And it, it, it could, in a generation or two, dissolve just by virtue of the fact that you move on to the next thing. It's not really the primary identity anymore. Of course, there are other types of identity in Europe as well. I mean, um, if you look at Spain, uh, at the moment, the, the Catalan separatist movement is very strong. It always has been strong, actually. Um, and um, it's often seen as being benign, I mean, especially if you compare it to the Basque um, separatists. Uh, it's not inconceivable that um, the Catalans will decide to go independent quite soon. Um, and it's more likely to happen than Scotland is. And it's probably more viable than Scotland is as an independent state. Um, now, the question is, does one consider Catalan nationalism to be sectarian or communist or whatever? Point um, um, about insecurity. Um, how do you explain the sectarianism here where people are actually quite secure and actually quite... With, I know they've got links, fami familial links and cultural links, but actually if you, if you open up a subject like Syria or Bahrain and uh, in two different communities, you're going to get very, very different answers and very robotic, automatic responses based on you know, no sort of facts or any sort of... Uh, you know, humanity is just about literally sectarianism or identity or whatever you want to call it, communalism or whatever. How do you explain that? How do you explain? Do you, do you say when you said about Britain, sectarianism is it, you know comes about through periods of insecurity, but over here, let's say in Europe, where we are actually quite withdrawn from all that, why why take a position on Syria and Bahrain? Why why do people feel the need to? Oh, people that do either have a particular interest, I think, or they have some sort of affiliation. Um, so, you know, I think your average Joe doesn't really have an, a, a position on it. They may have a perceived position through influence, media, whatever they've read. Um, but the people that do tend to be engaged on the matter, I think. It's just, it's just the fact that they're engaged on the matter and it's something that forms part of their identity. Um, probably a product of being second generation Britons where there is still a fairly, um, uh, a fairly mature link with a place where the, the first generation came from. And, and perhaps with time that's dissolved, perhaps not. It, it really depends on the community, on the society. It's, I think it's varied. I think that, uh, that's actually a very interesting point because Fanag um, Haddad, who I mentioned earlier, he's continuing his research in, uh, uh, on Iraq. And he's actually found the Iraqi communities outside Iraq are more sectarian than the Iraqis inside Iraq, it's which crazy. is fascinating. It's I mean, crazy, I don't it? think he's still, you know, he, does, he hasn't found the answer. But it's weird in this secure environment where we, we don't even have weapons. Um, he's found them to be, you know, more sectarian. You know I think I one example that really um, angered me was I had two, two friends in my house uh, a while ago. I don't know if any of you know about Uthman. He was a, a Sunni kid from Baghdad who, when the famous Jis al uh, uh, episode happened and uh, hundreds of pilgrims were killed, he actually jumped into the water and he was saving Shia pilgrims. Uh, I think he saved seven, eight, and on, on one of his last attempts, he, was at, he actually drowned uh, trying to save the kid. And he, he was a hero in Iraq, and especially in Baghdad. And you know, we were talking the really ugly days of Baghdad. And yet, one of, well, both of the guys who were in my house uh, said, Uthman wasn't saving the kids, he was drowning them. And I said, I said what are you talking about? You know, seven people, uh, you know, w their lives were saved. And he said, no, he, he, subhanAllah, he died while he was trying to kill uh, uh, the Shia. And I actually related the story to Fana Haddad immediately, b without me telling him where this was and who said it. He said, the person who said it was an Iraqi, and he's living in London. And I said, yeah, and it's, it's very interesting, actually. Was he a Najafi? He was Najafi, yes. <laughs> <laughs> actually, there were two. One was Najafi, one was Baghdadi, just to be on the record.
Um, can I just ask about the term that you've used, insecurity? Um, it kind of implies um, that what this is based on is not necessarily kind of embedded in reality. In some senses, a kind of figment to people's, to an extent, a figment of people's imagination. Um, would you, would you, <coughs> would you, would you say that's correct? Just because of the way imagination is per perceived, I'd say people's perceptions. Um, but that's that's how social constructs are. You know, the way if I just if I when I step out of this building, the the way I feel about how safe I am, how much hope I have in this world, um, my identity is is a product of my perception. Um, and that perception can deteriorate very quickly. You can see social sec security deteriorate very quickly when something can happen that can change the social psyche and people's perceptions of security can erode very, very quickly. Um, and it's always easier, in my view, to destroy than it is to build. It's a lot e harder to try and build that sense of security. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a fairly given that it's a product of, uh, of our perception. But that's how social constructs are. The law is the same, the political dynamic is the same, the way we perceive rights uh, what's my right, what's your right? I mean, these are all things that we agree to a large extent in civil society, and we consent to it. Um, that's, so, that's society, I think. I, I'm sorry to ask something which is not very academic or very, very, very deep thought, but it's a gut feeling, and it's provoked but by what Haider narrated as a story about uh, this terrible person who considers the savior uh, a culprit or a... A He's monster. probably going to watch this on YouTube. So, uh, so. I, I mean, uh, isn't it that uh, if uh, a child, if we take a child or even an adult and abuse them for a while, they become abusers? So if if you are bombarded with uh, suicide bombers and uh, having just graduated from Saddam Hussein, uh, massive graves, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is it strange that some people have this severe or very uh, pro pronounced degree of uh, maybe you call it uh, turning the facts upside because they have been so badly damaged and even this day and age still now how do you account for a country which is independent run by the majority and it still suffers endless blind violence specifically at a particular sex how do you expect people to to evolve I mean here we have in this country, after 25 years, Ivan Fletcher was shot outside the Libyan embassy. After 100 years, we still remember Ivan Fletcher. I mean, what the Iraqis are doing, I think, in comparison, is, is really the bare minimum. I think Iraqis, on the whole, are very forgiving, especially the Nejafi and the Karbala and the rest of them. Of course. <laughs> I'm interested just to know, b because you asked me on our perception, what your view is, and what the view is perhaps in the, in the audience. Um, no, I think I was, um, so I would have said um, that um, Middle Eastern politics kind of is, is driven by a number of factors. I wouldn't have necessarily used the term uh, that you used, um, because that, I think, I think there are definitely things on the ground that um, manifest themselves um, in kind of negative ways with certain communities. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that happens is suddenly a conspiracy against your kind of particular group. But I think there probably has been marginalization of particular communities. And so I think, I think the term that you used implies kind of that it's illusory. And I don't think it, it is completely. I think, I think there is a kind of reiteration um, bred by kind of factors, but I don't necessarily think that the kind of um, the kind of main like the foundation of it is illusory. If that makes sense. Okay, well it's good you said that because that wasn't my intent. My intent wasn't to say that therefore it's it, it, there is no f causal factor in, in in the external world. It's just a product of kind of your own little bubble. That's not what I my, my meant at all. But the sense of insecurity you have is a product of your perception. And that perception can be hugely deteriorated by what's happening in the outside world, absolutely. Anyone? Anyone? Can I just raise, well, 
just mention what I said before, which is um, um, why shouldn't one use religious language? Why does religious language in itself have to be problematic? just has to be used carefully, right? Because it's so powerful, I think. Um, I, you know, I, I, obviously religious language is important, but I just see it being abused for other ends a lot of the time, and people can't see the difference between... When it's abused, people is, it's difficult for some people to see that, I think. And that's, I think, a lot of what goes on in terms of religious wars. Are they actually for religion, or are they actually for politics or economics or whatever it is? I think the point was made, I think it was Lord Carey, there was the previous archbishop or the one before him no, who the said, one. the previous one, who said um, the worst kind of oppression is religious oppression. So I think it, it gives a, a very big uh, boost. But that, that's also myth. I mean, it's myth. Absolutely. The, the idea that there's something particularly violent about religion or, or religious conflicts are particularly nasty is just not empirically true. Um, there's, there's actually a very interesting book called The Myth of Religious Violence, I mean, which does precisely that. I'm not going to debate a historian. So but but just, isn't yeah. it always religion that is seen as the culprit? If you look at Northern Ireland, it's religion. Look at Spain, it's religion. If you look at the Middle East, although from what I glean from what, your lecture, what you've said, and it's been very interesting and very, very enlightening for me particularly, that sectarianism isn't the driving force, it is the external forces that are perpetuating that sectarianism to get their own agenda. Um, and in answer to your question, using, banning religious terms or using religious language is not the issue, it is exactly what Ali said, when people exploit that and exploit people's ignorance about things. Classic example of he was drowning when that's when it becomes a problem, when it's all right to kill somebody because he is of a particular faith or a particular culture. That is a huge problem. Well, what is the answer, though? I mean, I, I don't know. I think we have, we, we have a bit of a crisis of definition here, um, because when we talk about religion, we have to be very careful what we mean by religion. I think all language needs to be used carefully, because language is emotive. Um, I see language that could be hurtful in the corporate environment. And my God, it's hard to recover those situations. Now, it doesn't necessarily lead to violence and deterioration of social violence and so on. Where religion perhaps has a unique status is the fact that it forms part of someone's identity and value structure. But that's not necessarily religious. You can take that phrase religion, put it to one side, and therefore you have value, uh, identity and value structure. That could be political. So it's no longer a religion. You can put that word completely to one side. It becomes identity and value. And it depends how you feel about those values. It depends how you use them. And it depends how you provoke other people with them. And perhaps the factor of religion, I say politics falls into this category in the same way, is that those kinds of ideas tend to be very categorical. And when you present categorical ideas with people that don't share your perspective, there is no common frame of reference. And that's where they can be hard to reach a, an understanding. But perhaps that's where division arises. And therefore, perhaps an excess or, or, or an increased level of caution needs to be practiced. But the same uh, applies to political language. Political language can be very categorical. And therefore, you end up with uh, divisive language and, or language that could be appear, appears to be divisive. That's my view on the matter. Can I give a very brief example just to help people who think the religious is uh, so cancerous? When uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, the Palestinians supported, they cheered Saddam Hussein. So when the Americans reoccupied Kuwait and uh, kicked Saddam Hussein out, what did the Kuwaitis do to the Palestinians? There were hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in Kuwait. They are Sunnis. What did they do to them? Within days or weeks, they were all evicted. No jobs, no security, no, no, nothing. And that, actually, some people, that was a main reason of what happened to the deterioration of the Palestinian cause, because these people used to send remittances to the West Bank. So this is a, a, a clear example of how the Kuwaiti, because they are an elite, uh, rich people who were using these people as minions, decided they don't need them, and they uh, you know, took revenge on them. Another example, in the 50s and 60s in Iraq, it wasn't mainly religion that was the uh, 
like the dynamo or the powerhouse of what was going on in society. It was social and economic issues, and the Communist Party was the biggest party. And the same violence or violence was uh, like uh, done to the communists and vice versa. But in my personal opinion, I saw more violence against them done by the same people who at another stage became Salafis. So because the politics at the time, there are people who want to be at the top and they want to subjugate others and whatever fashion at the time. In America, they're all Christians, but the elite uh, made the blacks slaves and they, they go to churches, you know, the, the slaves, but they were used as slaves for centuries. Is that religion? They, are, they belong to the same religion. It's the human condition that uh, our respected uh, speaker talk. Religion sometimes can be the banner or the excuse, but on other times it could be race, politics, all sorts of things. People will always invent reasons to uh, abuse and uh, enslave others. Um. Can I say that? I think religion has um, a sense of kind of reference to something that's greater than us. And I think that's where it becomes problematic to use religious language because you're now, you now kind of bring divinity and authority into it, which I think other, other kind of um, points of reference don't necessarily or can't necessarily ascribe to. And I think, I think Tafik was right in that it, it kind of moves things, things beyond kind of debate um, uh, and you're kind of, you, you're not, you're, you don't have the same point of reference um, because you're now, you're kind of, in some senses, subscribing to a kind of higher authority. And that, and I think, that, and that, and beyond, and that becomes beyond criticism as well because you can't criticize people's, or it's, it's seen as problematic to criticize people's religious beliefs, whereas it's um, not necessarily um, problematic to criticize other types of beliefs. And I think that's why it becomes problematic to use religious language. Um, but, but I think it stifles debate. That's true of other types of language. I mean, the nation is transcendent. Eth the ethnos it's, it's, is transcendent. I don't think it has the same um, moral weight. I don't think people will say that it's morally uh, that's, right. That's that the, purely the, the a question of, of the perception of that individual. Um, I, I'm only, the only reason why I brought up the question is that basically, if you do use language does it, which is religious, does that necessarily make you sectarian? Because the problem is that's often the way it's seen. And um, even in... Um, I've been to so many workshops and briefings in the last two years in particular, which has always been about sectarianism is the most important thing in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, conferences where I, I was becoming like the sectarianism guy because they needed someone to speak on sectarianism and I was a sectarianism guy. Um, what that actually meant was I was basically talking about the Shia in the Gulf or Iraq or whatever, but a sectarianism guy. Um, and it, it, you know, it basically raises the question of, well, you know, how does one use that sort of language? And, um, and if someone is using religious language, as I said, it doesn't necessarily make them sectarian. Um, it's not necessarily the issue. And it also depends on how you do it. I mean, it, it's, um, um, it entirely depend, depends on register, it depends on context, it depends on all sorts of things. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that would be my only caveat. And um, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of other uh, things. Again, that's the danger of the question. It presents itself in a binary form where it needs to be yes or no. And I don't think that's a matter of yes or no. Um, and yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's much bigger than this. It's the use of language is just the use of language, full stop. I think we're missing the point, really, in terms of ice highlighting religion. I, I agree with your point in that, but I mean, you could remove the word religion and you can make anything that people have a categorical conviction in where they are unwilling to accept any other form of narrative can lead to division. So how you use that form of language, you need to be wise and accommodate plurality and people's, you know, the fact they don't share your reference point, or you could be divisive and say, in fact, no, this is my point of view, it's the only way, and furthermore, your way is completely flawed. But that's not a human conversation that's intellectual, that's just, that's just nonsense. Okay, unless there are any final points or that anyone wants to make. Um, I'm not reading out the Twitter comments. <laughs> I, I, I can't really see them. Um, and people can follow themselves, uh, what's going on. Uh, thank you for coming um, and being part of the conversation. Um, 
and mm. um, see you at, at the next event. The next experience. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. Th there will be plenty more. It, it'll keep me in, in business for quite a while. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>